In this video, we'll examine the low-level C code for our AI217 I.O. board. This software sample can be used in Windows, Linux, QNX, VXWorks, and on our embedded UEI pack. During this review, we'll focus on the basics of working with the UEI library. Our SDK comes with plenty of sample code to help you get set up with our hardware quickly and easily. If you go under Program Files x86, UEI, PowerDNA, SDK, Examples, you can find samples in the language of your choice for a wide variety of our boards. In this case, we're looking for the AI217 sample, and you can see that we provide an entire Visual Studio solution to get you started. Instead of showing the sample code opening in Visual Studio, let's just jump right in and get started. So here's the sample code. You can see at the beginning, we do all of our standard includes. Here we add the PowerDNA.h header file. This will provide you access to our entire library to interface with our hardware. Let's move on to device setup. Our samples follow a very specific convention. We use macros to define device parameters. We also use a second set of macros to make programming specific devices easier. In the case of the AI217 I.O. board, we can define all of our channels using this macro right here. If we peak definition in Visual Studio, you can see that we automatically provide the maximum number of channels. In this case, it's 16 channels. Additionally, if you're looking for a CJC with the AI217, we also provide that. We provide this macro for most of our I.O. boards, which should make programming custom applications a little bit easier. The next few macros allow us to define the board's gain. Because the 217 may be working with smaller voltages than plus or minus 10 volts, this sample code contains a number of gain options which you can also peak and change. I've equipped our input board with the loopback test adapter so we'll leave the gain set at 1. In this example, we're not going to use a CJC or a timestamp. We also set up a time delay for the chassis to instantly return an error message if it doesn't connect in time. This may help troubleshoot network issues if you're having them. Next up, we also provide an automatic handler if you want to call the SIGINT. Our code allows you to stop the sample at any time, and the program will disable anything that was enabled so that the system will always end in the default state. We'll go over this cleanup process in detail at the end of the video. Scrolling down, you may be intimidated by a lot of these custom data types, but there's nothing to be afraid of. As we go through the code, they will make much more sense in context. This part of the code is our set clock section. We'll cover this and sync setup as well as filters in future videos. Here around line 90, we actually get into the meat of our application. We will initialize the library by calling daclib here. We'll also bind the handler function to the SIGINT. If we call it SIGINT, the handler will drop the entire application directly to the end where we can clean up our library and boards and exit safely. DQ Open IOM actually provides a dual function. Not only does it open communication with the IOM, but we also receive diagnostic data about this IOM. This is where our first struct, the DQ RDCFG struct, comes into play. If we peek definition twice, we can see that this struct includes information about what exactly is in our chassis. You can find information like the model number, IP address, serial number, calibration dates, manufacturing dates, as well as devices installed and what options those devices might include. This might be useful in the case that you don't have physical access to your device. So here we print out the diagnostic info. It's a convention that we follow for all of our samples. You're welcome to ignore this part if you don't need it. In this next section, we'll first verify if the board is a 217, 218, or 228. This sample will work for any of those three boards. Additionally, we'll verify the board's operating mode. There are two options for this operating mode. 
The first is Ops mode, and the second is Config mode. In Config mode, we can do things like set up channel lists, set up filter settings, or set up other board-specific device parameters. Standard point-by-point -point polling mode will stay in Config mode. In Ops mode, on the other hand, we follow strict timing guidelines to make sure you get your data in a deterministic way. VMAP, DMAP, and other similar modes will use Ops mode specifically. If the connection to a chassis is lost while the chassis is in Ops mode, the chassis cannot be reconfigured or reused until it is cleaned up correctly. In this case, Check Ops mode will send that chassis directly to the cleanup section. During cleanup, the chassis will safely exit Ops mode and clean up properly so that the next time the program is run, it can be run correctly. Next, let's move to channel list setup. Here you can see that this entire block largely checks whether there is a CJC or a timestamp channel and determines what to do if either of those is present. We usually either set the timestamp first or last and set up the CJC after the channel list. In this case, because we have neither, this entire block of code really boils down to this line right here. Every channel is one spot in the channel list array, and each of these channels is represented by the actual channel number, in this case 0 to 15, and the gain flag ORed into that channel number. This way, when we pass the channel list to the board, the board will know to set up a channel on, for example, channel 14 with a gain of 8. There are a number of channel flags we use for our other boards, which we'll cover in a future video. Afterwards, we do a bit more housekeeping. We use DQADV 217 get PGA status to get the status of every channel on the board. For example, if it is driven up to the rails, then that's an issue. That's an error condition. And this function will return data pertinent to that error condition. Because this next section covers clock, sync, and filters, we'll be covering it in a different video. A little further down, this part is important. In this particular example, because we're going over point-by-point -point mode, we first need to set up the channel list. To set up the channel list, we need to pass it into dqadv217 read. If it returns a dq data not ready status, you can tell that the board is still reconfiguring itself to the channel list provided. For instance, if you're configuring a board with a channel list that only has odd channels, it will take a couple seconds for the board to initially configure itself to that list. Once this DQ data not ready flag goes away, we know that we're ready to read data from the board. We also have a short disconnection demo right here. When performing a disconnection test, what we do is run a small current through one input of the AI217 and read it back on the other input we can tell whether the wire is connected based on the current flowing through it. We'd recommend not reading voltage inputs and performing disconnection tests at the same time. As you can see right here, the test current could corrupt voltage readings. Now here in the while loop, we actually do our full acquisition. First, we perform the disconnection demo. Every time we call get PGA status, we can double check that the input of the board is connected correctly. Here we have a few different error messages that you could get out of PGA status return. I'll let you go through and peek the definition of all of these and see if you can get data necessary to your particular application out of this. Once we're done performing this disconnection test, we can actually read back the data. This will provide us with high precision, verified data based on the channel list you've configured. We'll print it back out to the terminal, wait about a second and a half based on this UEI pal sleep call right here, and then do it all over again. I think we've earned the right to actually read out the debugger. As mentioned earlier in this demonstration, we have a loopback adapter set up, so what we should be seeing is alternating sets of positive and negative 7.5 volts on the input. 
Now let's run our debugger. First, we see all of the diagnostic data that we expected. Next, we see 7.5 volts plus or minus alternating. So if you see this, you know you're running the sample correctly, you're receiving input data, and everything has worked as it should. Now to exit out of this, I'm not actually going to press the stop button on Visual Studio right here. What happens on the low level when you press the stop button is that the code is halted exactly where it is inside the while loop. What we want instead is to go to the cleanup section of our code and exit correctly. Once we hit Control C, the handler sets stop to 1 and the main loop is programmed to exit when the variable stop is non-zero. Once we call the sigint, if we go all the way back up to the top, you can see that the sigint passes the entire code into the handler, and the handler changes stop to true, which means that we can exit our while loop. This brings us all the way down here. The cleanup section consists of two major calls. In other modes, we might have other calls to exit out of that particular mode and unwind correctly. In this case, all we need to do is invalidate the channel list and close out the IOM. And we're done. If we were running a different acquisition mode that needed more cleanup code, we would do that here. But in this case and mode, we do not. In future videos, we'll be sure to explain this cleanup code in more detail. So, this wraps up our detailed look at the AI217 code sample. We hope this video has demonstrated how easy to use and how flexible our software library is to set up and run. You now have the basic tools to understand how all of our input samples work.